Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. This is the latest in a series of live stream looking at the various different uh, regions of rest, Westeros. Just trying to go through, dig into a little bit of the history, the people, the culture, and trying to understand what role they will play in the plot going forward. Uh, just before we uh, get going, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to my moderators. Uh, if you're watching live, they do a fantastic job, so uh, thank you very much to them. I also had a couple of super chats just before I went live. Uh, our super sticker from Ryan Larkin, thank you very much indeed. Also Mara Lee saying congratulations on getting 200k subscribers. Just a show of immense love, friendship, support for all the content, merch, and stories. You are the best. Hugs and love to your handsome dog, Dan. Uh, so, well, firstly, yes, I have got a very handsome dog, Dan, who is the best dog in the world. Uh, also, uh, yes, I reached 200,000 subscribers just a few days ago, and I am very excited. Um, and I'm also quite humbled and very thankful. And uh, I wanted just up front to say thank you to everyone who's supported this channel, supported me, uh, shared it, liked it, watched it, um, done a, a million and one different things. Uh, I am hugely grateful and thank you so much. So onward and upward, thank you. Uh, 300,000 is just around the corner, I'm sure. So thank you very much. Um, but today, what we're going to oh, in fact, before we get onto the Iron Islands, what I'm trying to do, if I remember, at the beginning of these live streams is just to give you a little flavor of some of the things happening in the wider world of um, fantasy and science fiction TV and books and all the rest of it. Um, I think the one thing which I was most excited by this week was it was kind of snuck out as uh, uh, an announcement. Netflix are developing. Um, Red Wall, which for those who don't know, the books by Brian Jack, this was something I read those books when I was uh, much younger and I hugely enjoyed them. So this is something which is adding to what we have at the moment, which is a, almost all of the largest, most successful book series of epic fantasy out there are now being either they have had films or TV shows based on them, or they are in development. So um, this, is, I think the next two or three years are a very, very exciting time to be a fan of uh, high fantasy in particular. There's so much out there in the works. We've got spin-offs from Game of Thrones. We've got Lord of the Rings TV show happening. Narnia's rights have been bought. We've got The Witcher, obviously, but there's so much going on right now that I am really very excited. So um, uh, that's uh, basically what's going on uh, right now. I think I did have a um, question uh, from uh, the Lady Eternal. Thank you so much, saying, good time zone, Robert. Missed the chance to put my question in on Patreon. Yeah, so patrons always get the chance to uh, have priority questions, but thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, saying, do you think Asha will be Queen of the Iron Islands by the end of A Song of Ice and Fire, and will her child by Carl the Maid be her heir? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to... We'll talk a lot about Asha, Yara on the... TV show, but the characters are a little bit different. Um, certainly their story arcs will be a little bit different. Will she end up being the queen? I think there's a good chance. I really do. Uh, I think that the, the biggest thing in her favour is the fact that Euron doesn't really care about the Iron Islands anymore. He's there, and yes, obviously he'll embrace it and his history and his, uh, his heritage, and he will take the Iron Fleet with him, but he doesn't. That's not where his vision is. He he wants not just to rule the Iron Islands. He wants to rule all of Westeros. He doesn't just want to rule all of Westeros. He wants to be a god. His vision is so much higher than the Iron Islands that I think he's taken his eye off of the Iron Island ball, and I think that someone like Asher can very easily uh, get in and reclaim it. I think that she is the person who has probably the best claim and definitely the most uh, supporters left there. So, um, yeah, I think that there's a very good chance. As for uh, her child, now we've not had a 100% confirmation that she is pregnant, in the books, she almost certainly is. 
just based on what she says, the kind of the hints that we've got, the language that George R. R. Martin uses. So probably she is. Now, that probably means that she's going to, um, given the fact that we've probably got more than nine months worth of action to come, she probably will give birth at some point. Now, the question is, where is she going to go and do that? I suspect that she will try and get herself back to the Iron Islands for that. So yes, I think there's a chance. I think the fact that if she has an heir, then I think this will probably bolster her claim. Um, she may even claim the Iron Islands on behalf of her child, her son, if she has a son, and rule in his stead as the sort of the queen regent. Um, question from... Um, Adam Selgerd, apologies, probably mispronounced that, but saying my first stream as a patron, welcome, thank you so much, uh, and patrons, I should probably say a special thank you to you uh, for your support in, uh, in this journey to 200,000, it's, um, I say it all the time, I know, you're probably bored of it, but I genuinely cannot do this, I cannot devote the time I do to doing this without the support of my patrons, so thank you so much. Um, saying, uh, Adam, I'm saying too bad I never have any good questions keep up the good work well thank you anyway I hugely appreciate it um uh Dominican stud 101 thank you saying congratulations on 200k thank you it took me seven months to read um world of ice and fire but it took me seven days to read fire and blood I love fire and blood possibly more than the main books stopping at the ending of Aegon III's regency is unfair there. It, it genuinely is. Um, I've been I've been working on a few videos recently, which you will see over the course of the next few days and weeks, based on Fire and Blood. I think as we're building towards it, it will be next year. But when the, the House of the Dragon, the TV show based on the Dance of the Dragons, comes out then a lot of that is going to be based on what we have got in Fire and Blood. So I've been doing quite a lot of preliminary stuff there, just um, a couple of questions. You may have seen the Did the Maesters Kill the Dragons video I did recently. I'm also, I've just finished and hopefully at some point soon we'll get up a video looking at uh, an overview of the Dance of the Dragons. If you haven't got time to read through Fire and Blood, but just want to have a 10, 15 minute overview, then i I've done one of those. Um, and yes, it is frustrating that we end it where we do. But I mean, it's as good a place as any to end the story, to pick it up again afterwards. Because the Dance of the Dragons, without going into all of the detail, does mark the turning point for House Targaryen. Before that, their star was on the rise. The numbers of dragons were increasing. The number of Targaryens were increasing. Their power was strong and growing stronger all the time. After the Dance of the Dragons, then, yes, there were some high points, but it was a gradual decline. So this is where the sort of the hinge point for House Targaryen comes at the end of Fire and Blood Part 1. We will get Fire and Blood Part 2, he says, fingers crossed, um, but not for a very long time. This might be my ludicrously optimistic side coming through, but George R. Martin has said he's obviously focusing on the Winds of Winter, then he wants to write another Duncan Egg, and then he wants to write A Dream of Spring, and then after that we will get Fire and Blood Part 2, so not for a very long time. Um, but, uh, yeah... Finishing it when he did, it does mark a natural end, even though it was very frustrating and it left a lot of key questions uh, that were uh, out there. Um, so, um, yeah, I understand your frustration. I also enjoy I know quite a few people who really enjoyed reading Fire and Blood, uh, perhaps uh, more so even than um, A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, Ariel Winchester saying, hi, Robert, I like your theory on the importance of the Iron Islands with the children of the forest and the others, uh, or the importance of islands with the children of the forest and the others. Do you think the Iron Islands will be included in the theory? Uh, this is, uh, thank you uh, for the question. The For those who don't know it, this is, I mean, I don't know whether it counts as a theory so much as an observation. 
but the if you look at where the the key places are for the sort of the uh, I could say for the children of the forest, but for the battle against the others, um, you start start to see a link quite quickly. First of all, you have the Isle of Faces, which is clearly an island. Then you have Dragonstone, which is where all of the dragon glass comes from, and we know that dragon glass is what is the most important tool for uh, fighting the others or the. Um, the uh, uh, um, the whites. Then, if you go with the idea, which I personally do, that the sword Dawn, the uh, the sword that House Dane holds, is probably Lightbringer. It's certainly the only sword which has lasted since the first Long Night, and the name Dawn connected to the Long Night is very suspicious um then you say well where is that and where is it held it's on an island so immediately you have three very very important islands and you could perhaps add a fourth on if you take battle island which is where um the high tower is which is a, again a very ancient site so islands seem to be quite important and it's almost as if the Children of the Forest have identified this as a way to protect their most important places. Now, that ties in with the idea that perhaps the others cannot cross running water in some way. Certainly, again, it's suspicious that the wall seems to end literally at the water water's edge. Uh, the East Watch, the wall just comes to an end, and it's not as if who is it's hard to get around it there is there are trade routes literally happening between the wildlings and the night's watch there on east watch they just get in a boat and go around the outside of the wall so that is not hard and it it would be an incredible oversight if the others could literally the way that the others can get past the wall is just get in a boat and go around it. So there is a hint there that perhaps water is a problem, added to which George R. R. Martin loves this idea of sort of echoing from our own legends and history, and obviously crossing running water is a thing, for the undead is, is a big issue in our own legends and history. So um, if you take that as an idea, as an observation, as I say, I don't think it's a fully worked up theory so much as an observation, you then have to say, well, what about the Iron Islands? Now, my take is that actually, no, they are not part of this, because the islands that we have got, they're broadly speaking, they're relatively close to the mainland. Dragonstone is perhaps an exception, although over time, maybe that's moved away a little bit, who knows. But the, the Iron Islands are a, a reasonable distance from the mainland, and we do not hear of weirwood trees being there. In fact, there are, and I will come on to this later, there are several instances on the Iron Islands of what seem to be dead weirwood trees in one way or another, which implies that perhaps the distance is too far, maybe the stone underground is too hard for the weirwood roots to get through. We know that weirwood trees seem to need to be connected up to the main weirwood network. So my personal perspective is that the Iron Islands are actually separate from this. They are not part of uh, the uh, weirwood network as a whole, and they're not part of whatever it is that connects those different islands. Um, question from, um, who, who did I have a question for? Ah, Mr. Silverstein, thank you so much, saying, I love the channel and your content so well put together. Thank you. Do you think Euron will reveal any secrets to us from Valeria, or were his exploits all talk? So, Euron claims to have gone to old Valeria. He claims to have gone to the Smoking Sea. Are we to believe him? 
I mean, probably, but he he went all around Essos. We know this. We we hear stories of the fact that he took his boat, the Silence, all the way around Essos, and we know that he captured various captured various other boats and took artifacts from them. For example, he captured the boat that had the warlocks who were hunting down Danny, and he captured what they had there. But if anyone has been to Old Valyria and survived, then it is Euron. I don't think we'll ever get the, the real truth of this, but if he does have a, a suit of Valyrian steel armour, that certainly, which is what he appeared to be wearing in one of the pre-release chapters from The Winds of Winter. If he does have that, then that does seem to be reasonable proof that he went there. And um, I, the, the thing is that George R. R. Martin has gone to great lengths to tell us how dangerous this is. Fire and Blood was another example. He again and again, he wanted to give us stories of how dangerous old Valeria is. You get the, um, when Valerian the Black Dread flew over there with Aria Targaryen and came back and Valerian the Black Dread, the most ancient, fiercest dragon Westeros ever knew, came back with huge gashes down its side. This is a dangerous place. George R. R. Martin wants us to understand how dangerous it is. So I think if Euron did go there, this is to show us, A, how absolutely um, crazy is the wrong word, but single-minded, um, uh, unhinged he is. No, nobody in their right mind would go there. And, and B, it would show us that um, if he did go there, this is a one-off. People do not do this. This He is, I mean, yes, he's got a massive ego, but some of it is actually earned. So uh, I, he could well have gone there is what I'm saying, but I don't think we'll ever know the truth because the people on his ship, the silence, it's called the silence because he rips all of their tongues out so they can't say anything. And because people tend not to be able to read and write, then they cannot communicate the, the stories. So he may well have been there, but we're not going to find out for sure. Is he going to tell us any secrets? He may brag a bit more at some point. Wouldn't surprise me, but I don't think that I don't think we have to believe everything that he says. Um Question from Prince of Quarkness. Thank you very much. Saying, felicitations on 200k. Thank you. Uh, you've said the books won't give outright info regarding the gods. How much evidence is there for the drowned gods' existence or influence? Uh, yeah, so the books won't give us a direct evidence of the gods. And I'm, that's not just me saying that. George R. R. Martin has said that he, we will not see the gods in his stories. He's been very clear on this. He is far, far more interested in humans' reactions to the concept of gods rather than the reality or not of gods. So that's the situation we're in uh, regarding the gods. Now, that obviously still allows us to speculate on whether the gods exist or not. Now, the drowned god is a distinct religion for the Ironborn. Is there any existence that it's true? I mean, not huge amounts is the honest answer. Uh, the uh, the religious um, uh, kind of uh practices that they have that aren't hugely magical the way that they have their sort of the drowning and being reborn is clearly symbolic but it's also very clear that this is the bringing back to life thing is a sort of version of cpr this isn't that they do some magic to bring people back it's a it's a fantasy version of 
um, baptism, basically. So that is there. Do we see the, the drowned God answering prayers hugely? It's, it depends on your interpretation. You get uh, stories of how the drowned God has done certain things in the past. It's a matter of whether you believe them. I suspect what we will see is um, when uh, Aaron Damp Hair will call on his God and his God will answer if you wish or he will believe that his God is answering with Krakens coming from the deep but then there's a perfectly rational explanation there if you want one that there is there will be lots of uh, blood in the water and we know that Krakens are attracted by blood in the water so it's left open to interpretation. George R. R. Martin does this with all of his religions. He leaves it open to interpretation. And we're not going to be, as, as well as the fact that we're not going to see the gods, we're not going to be given any hard proof that any of the gods specifically do exist. I would, out of the ones, uh, out of, if you had a sort of a hierarchy of the, the gods or the religions that seem to be most connected in, with magic that works which is probably the best proxy that we do have to whether or not the religion is true then i would personally put the ironborn uh, and the religion of the drowned gods somewhere near the bottom because we've had not had huge amounts of evidence of it yet i suspect we probably will have a little bit more in the future um kevin warner thank you so much saying will asher theon storyline end up allying with daenerys or fagon uh, the sixth or another person does uh, theon die for a stark like the show i think that it won't be exactly like the show i feel i say that most weeks Theon's storyline is closely aligned with the Starks. So Theon is going to stay um, up north and he will get some sort of... I'll talk about Theon a little bit more depth in a moment, but he will get some degree of redemption, I feel sure. So his his redemption has to come from him confronting his demons and making amends for what he did and the things that he did which were bad and wrong were mostly against house stark so that is where his fate is tied up asha um is not on, on the show she was very tied in with theon yes she is close to him he's her brother but i don't think it's going to be that close in the books i suspect as I say, that at some point soon she is going to break away from what's happening in the north and head over to the Iron Islands. Now, um, I, I've mentioned a few times in the north that the big constraining factor in the north is the weather. It is it is winter and it is a bad, bad winter and it's only going to get worse. Stannis's army is effectively snowed in. Um, they're having to eat their own horses, it's getting really bad for them. So the idea, and people pitch these ideas at me every now and then, that somebody who's currently down south will end up in the north very quickly, and it's like, practically, no, that's not going to happen. I suspect that Melisandre will perform some sort of weather magic to ease things, but Asher... Actually, if you look at the geography all of this, she can relatively easily, I would have thought, get across to the Iron Islands compared to a lot of other potential journeys because the Iron Islands are actually not that far from the north. She just has to get across because she's a very skilled captain. All she has to do is get across to the coast and get a boat of some kind, and that will work for her. So... Um, I don't think their storylines will be the same as on the show. I think that Theon will end up allying with Daenerys to the extent that the North will, but I think that will be a lot more of a um, marriage of convenience or politics more than anything else, not a true alliance. And I think Asher is going to be winding up the Greyjoy storyline more than anything else because that's not Theon's endpoint 
this is Asher's endpoint. So um, that's where that's where I see them uh, diverging. They're not going to just to be clear. They're not going all the way over to Marine, meeting Daenerys and then coming back with her. That that's Victarion is doing that. Um, he's got a very different mission, but it's his boats that. Daenerys will use. So this idea that uh, on the show that they had that Daenerys had the Iron Fleet and was sailing with that back to Westeros, that is sort of picking up on the idea that she is going to capture Victarion's fleet and then use that to be going back to Westeros because we hear again and again this is the thing which comes up, one of the reasons why she doesn't sail over to Westeros. I haven't got the boats. Victarion has just uh, gone over there with a whole load of boats. Um, question from Mr. E. Knight. Can you talk about the Grey King and the lore of Naga's Bones? I love Iron Island's ancient magic tie-in as one of the few places with oily black stone. Yep, so again, I will talk about oily black stone in a bit more detail in a moment. But the Sea Stone Chair is this is the the throne the ancient throne of the rulers of the iron islands now it's ancient it is it's the shaped like a kraken it's a throne shaped like a kraken and it is made out of oily black stone and oily black stone is something which is found in a few places across planetos it is ancient Nobody knows where it comes from. It's not to be um, confused with other types of blackstone that we have, but what seems to have happened, regardless of how you view this, is that whenever the Iron Worm got to the Iron Islands, then they discovered the Sea Stone Chair. This isn't something that they created. It is something that they discovered. Now, the this was their from who knows where. My personal feeling is this is a sort of a, an homage from George R. R. Martin. He's got a couple of these dotted around. Um, it, it, an homage to H.P. Lovecraft with this idea of the Deep Ones. They talk that this is part of the legends of the Ironborn, is that the Deep Ones were there before. And ages before humans were around, when I say ages, I mean we're talking millennia, thousands, eons of years Oh yeah, uh, the world was ruled by deeper, darker, more malevolent forces, uh, perhaps forces that were not even of that planet. And that's an H.P. Lovecraft kind of feel that George R. R. Martin, I think, is sort of nodding to. I don't think he's going to explore it in huge amounts in this uh, set of stories that we have, but I think that is the um the thing that he's nodding towards so that is where the sea stone chair comes from um the gray king um was he's this legendary king who apparently ruled for a thousand years again this is age of hero stuff each part of the seven kingdoms they've got their own legends from the age of heroes and this is the gray king is part of the ironborns legends from that time and he apparently he lived for a thousand years and in fact he didn't even die he just sort of went down into sea to sort of meet his creator so to speak um this is therefore their equivalent of like bran the builder one of their kind of establishment myths naga's ribs however i would love to talk about as well because um in on the island of old wick there are, and I was about to launch into ages ago, the start of the stream, I was going to launch into sort of an overall description of the Iron Islands, but I will give this bit now. There are 31, I think, islands in the main archipelago of the Iron Islands. One of them is the holiest, which is known as Old Wick. And on that, there is this place called Naga's Ribs. Now, this is where uh, the King's Moot uh, meets to decide who is going to be the king of the Iron Islands. And as it's described, it's just this series of um, uh, sort of white, they're called ribs, 
Naga's ribs. Naga was Naga was apparently a sea dragon that got defeated and um, uh, decomposed on the shoreline. And what we're left now is that the carcass and the only things left are these white uh, stone uh, rib-like things. Now, to me. They feel, and we don't have, we haven't got anyone who's gone up to them and sort of analysed them in great detail, so we don't know. But they almost feel a bit like a grove of weirwood trees because they are white. They have uh, ossified. They're almost stone-like, um, and it feels that that's the kind of feel that we've got there. I don't have the evidence for that, but that's the kind of the feel of what we've got going on there. But again, the legend is that these are sea dragon ribs. And this is one of the founding myths that we've got there. And this is where the holy place is that, uh, that they meet to decide who is the, uh, the king, the rightful ruler of the Iron Islands. Um, just checking if I had another question. I think I had. Uh, yep, question from oh Charlotte Cooper. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Didn't see a question uh, with that. If there was one, then um, oh yeah. Uh, just saying, first time I've caught the live and never done a chat before. Uh, congrats on 200k. Excellent content creator. Well researched subjects. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much, uh, Brendan. Um, thank you for the super chat. Saying hello. How fast will you get through the winds of winter when it's released? I'm quite a slow reader myself. I do not want anything spoiled myself, but I want to follow you at the same time. What to do? Um, well, when it's released, who knows when it will be released, but um, I, I will read it as fast as I possibly can. And then I will read it again, um, <laughs> is the short answer. Uh, in terms of making videos, I haven't yet decided how... I will structure that. I suspect that I will start with some kind of relatively high level analysis of um, different character storylines or or a sort of overviews overview of the story development as a whole, and then later on perhaps getting slightly more granular about either chapter by chapter or um, theme by theme, something along those lines. So that's where it is. In I will certainly for the first little while try my very best not to spoil anything with you know the thumbnails or anything like that um i might give a few thoughts as i go through on twitter again with a spoiler um warning but um yeah i suspect that i will just devote as long as i need to read it um and i will let people know when it gets announced uh, then we will certainly have at least three months, I suspect, to build up to it, and I will let people know how I will cover it. But uh, thank you. Um, question from uh, Alexandra Polvikov. Uh, apologies, no, I can't again, I can't see a question attached there. Um, if there was one, please do let me know, or let one of the um. Mods know Ultraviolent saying, Hi Robert, what do you think of the idea of water whites manifesting in characters like Patchface and possibly Davos connected to the drowned god? Um well I I think these are thematic rather than linked to the religion. So certainly with Davos, we don't get any um, and for those who are wondering why Davos, a white, where's that coming from? During the Battle of the Blackwater, then he basically he jumped overboard, and this is how he survived. And he ended up, you probably remember, uh, on the show when he like ended up on a small island, just sort of like, trying to catch the attention of a passing boat to get him to be able to get back to Dragonstone. Um, and the way it's written leaves open the possibility that you know it all it all goes dark and then he wakes up and finds himself uh washed ashore um then this is um possible that he he died and came back or maybe it's just exactly what we read that he just um washed up 
So if it were the drowned god, then there's nothing. He doesn't think, oh, I, I, it all went dark, then I saw the drowned god, and now I'm back. So he certainly doesn't think this is some kind of religious thing going on there. Similarly with Patchface, Patchface is a, f a fascinating character, um, but the more I read Patchface and think about Patchface, it, it doesn't seem religious. He also doesn't seem to have a particular agenda. He just seems genuinely to have some kind of uh, link, magical link in with something that allows him, from his own perspective, in the ways that he sees the world, to be saying stuff that might be relevant. That is where he's at. It, it certainly, he certainly never seems to be trying to get people to recognize that the drowned god is there or anything like that. So, are these drowned god water whites? No, I don't think so. I love this idea of there being different types of whites. George R. R. Martin kind of introduced it, us to this when he talked about fire whites, and then we go, oh, well, maybe we've also got science whites with what Kyburn has been doing. Uh, are these now water whites? Um, maybe we can call them water whites. Maybe they are brought forth magically in some way, but I, the connection with the Drowned God seems limited, it has to be said. And it, we do have to be very clear that there's more than one kind of water magic going on in this world of ice and fire. To uh, suggest that this is everything to do with water magic is the Drowned God, I think would be, and I'm not, I don't think you're suggesting this, but I think that would be overstating it. We we certainly get the, the Ruinar, there's definitely some water magic going on there, we get the Merlin King, we get lots of different bits of water magic, water religion uh, symbolism going on around, and I don't think that this necessarily, we should necessarily ascribe any kind of water magic over to the drowned god. I think what we need to do is try and work out what is at the root of all of this magic and say that's what ha what's happening. It's not necessarily to do with the different religions that we've got going on here. Um, question from uh, Nate Phipps, thank you, say, saying, do you think the Ironborn created the Drowned God because the Weirwood network is limited to mainland Westeros, therefore no Weirwoods meant the Ironborn needed an alternative religion? Um, possibly. So I think that the... the the Ironborn having a religion connected with the sea, it, it makes sense. And it makes sense that if they didn't personally create it, then it kind of developed with them and with their culture. So th that I think is undeniable. The history of the Ironborn seems to be that they were first men, that were first men who for whatever reason headed over to the Iron Islands and then they either, and we don't know what the timing of this was, it was, if it was before the pact, then they went over with whatever first men religions they had beforehand. If it was after the pact, then perhaps they did go over worshipping the old gods, but yeah, they couldn't grow any weirwood trees, and so that kind of died out over time. In any event, I think the fact that the Iron Islands are cut off from the mainland has allowed whatever proto-religion that they either brought with them or developed as a result of their surroundings, which is, when you think about it, it's actually quite basic, their religion in terms of like, storms are bad, the sea is good, this is just what their life is like. And uh, that distancing from the mainland influenced the development of their religion, and it also influenced the development of their culture and their um, exceptionalist, ideas this is that there is definitely an ironborn exceptionalism we are different we are better our god is um they, they don't seem to think that their god rules the entire world but they definitely think their good god looks after them and is therefore in charge in their area which is the sea so um i think the 
that's a slightly rambly uh, answer to say that, yeah, I think that if they developed it, it was definitely as a result of the Weirwoods network not being there. And if uh, if it was somehow introduced to them, then the fact that the Weirwood network was not operating probably helped that develop. Um, question from... I think I had another question in the chat, just trying to find it. Um, Cloaked one, thank you very much, saying, hi, Robert, congrats on 200K. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, very generous super chat. I've got a theory about Balon Blackskin. In A World of Ice and Fire, it mentions that no weapons could harm his skin. Is this reference to possible Valyrian steel armor? If so, could Euron have this already? Um, I mean, I I kind of like the idea that he did get the Valyrian steel armor from uh, old Valyria. That that does add something to the legend of who he is. My general take is that no, the Valyrian steel armor is so rare to the extent that it's no one has heard or seen of it this is above and beyond anything that anyone could imagine happening in westeros so the idea that this has been hiding away somewhere in the iron islands for all this time and suddenly euron finds it that doesn't quite work for me i have to say it's uh, i i think that if if it is Valyrian steel armor, then he has got it from um, somewhere. If it's not old Valyria, then it's some he's raided a ship or raided someone who had it far away in Essos. But he did go; he's gone all the way over to um, a shire and places like that. So he doesn't have to have got it from uh, old Valyria. He could have got it from various other places. So um, I like the thinking. I, I like the idea that these kind of legends could have become um uh, could have come from a very practical source that certainly is the way that george r. r martin's mind works but i think in this instance no i think that valyrian steel armor would be so uh rare and interesting and exciting that i don't think it could have been kept hidden um and, and as i say i I kind of like the idea that it was you're on getting it from somewhere. Okay, I think that's me caught up on the chat. So I will go with um, some questions from um, my patrons. Dominic Vaughan saying, hi, Robert. Hope you are well, sir. Thank you. I am. Um, been getting back into the IDG content recently, and as a huge Lord of the Rings fan, I love that you have picked this up. Good. I'm glad you're enjoying the Lord of the Rings uh, videos. I was called for jury duty last week, and your videos were providing a welcome distraction to the case while I was on lunch. Well, uh, I do love hearing how, where, how, when, and where people listen to these videos. Uh, jury duty. This is the first uh, first time that I've been um, uh, involved in jury duty. That's uh, exciting. Uh, in terms of the Iron Islands, what do you think the end point of the narratives have in store for Theon and Euron, respectively? Theon, as you've described, potentially undergoing the only valid redemption character arc in A Song of Ice and Fire. Euron trying to undergo apotheosis. Is he connected to the second long night or not? And who will defeat him and how? Um, right, so the, the end game for Theon, you, you say quite rightly, I've, I've said this before, redemption arc is a phrase that we use a lot in the Song of Ice and Fire fandom, and that genuinely doesn't seem to be although yes on the tv show they they did like this idea it genuinely doesn't seem to be where george r, r. martin's mind naturally goes so many of the characters who have potentially got a sort of redemption arc 
people might maybe Sandor Clegane or um, uh, I, I, mean, I don't know Jamie Lannister, someone like that. We look at them and think, have they got a redemption arc? I don't think it's going to be a classic redemption arc for those characters. I think there will be twists. I think perhaps they might be going back um, along the way with Theon. I think that he is the one character who potentially has the genuine redemption arc in that we have seen him and this happens in the books. He goes right down to the very bottom and then slowly he's working his way back up. And I think that we will see him get some kind of achieve some kind of personal um, uh contentment at having made amends for what he's done that we could call a redemption arc so i think that that is definitely where his character is going that means as as the evil that he's done is connected in with house stark that means that his redemption arc has to be connected in with house stark so that is where he is going i think that there is a very good chance that he will give his life in defense of house stark so that i think is where it will end up probably not same way as on the show but probably in defense of someone like Bran because of the fact that he um everyone thought he had killed Bran so for the fact for everyone to think that he saves Bran at the end has a kind of a a nice echoing a nice kind of symmetry to it so that's where I think the Theon is going to go Euron is going to carry on uh, trying to become a god, destroy the world, and until he gets stopped. That is, that is, it's not an arc for <laughs> Euron. He's just going to just charge on through. How is he going to die? I think that George R. R. Martin has given us a hint in Fire and Blood with the in the story of the Dance of the Dragons. Um, when we get the, um, a one-eyed character on a dragon dying in a fight between dragons over the god's eye lake i think that is how he is going to die i think that the there are other kind of layers of imagery sort of added up into that aemond targaryen was aemond one eye was his name and he uh, he on his dragon died whilst fighting um daemon targaryen now um i think what this means is that Euron will get a dragon. I think that he will uh, probably fight. Um, I mean, my guess is probably John, uh, who will also be on a dragon. And I think that uh, although uh, Aemond will, Aemond slash Euron, one eye will die what George R. R. Martin left us with was the hint that they never found Damon's body. So the other person in this kind of past echo of what is going to happen possibly survived. And I think John will survive that battle. And um, so that I think is what's going to happen. And I think that Euron, as well as Cersei, is going to represent the kind of Saruman figure in this kind of crossover that we've got George R. R. Martin he's not redoing the Lord of the Rings but he has said if you want to understand Bittersweet you have to as an ending you have to read the scouring of the Shire the scouring of the Shire at a very high level is the very the very end of the Lord of the Rings but after the big baddie has been defeated the the secondary baddie is still has to be defeated and the secondary baddie uh is uh, there and the heroes have to come back and fight him this was saruman in the scouring of the shire and fight him before they can uh, return the land to some semblance of uh, the new normal so that is i think what the ending is for euron this incidentally means that his role will only increase over the course of the next book he will get uh, a lot more important and he is not just this kind of 
side character who is supporting Cersei. In fact, it will probably end up being the other way around, that Cersei will appear to be the character supporting Euron. Uh, Alexandra Polvek again i apologize for mispronouncing that i will try my best to get it right next time did euron meet the shrouded lord any thoughts on who this could be i like the idea that it's garion lannister since he hesitates killing Tyrion. okay so the shrouded lord is um uh, in the sorrows now the sorrows well, i was talking a little while ago about the roinar uh, this is the great battle when the um the valyrian empire were basically taking on the roinar and the the roinish people started to actually make some headway but then obviously the valyrians um uh, just finally took them over overwhelmed them and what was left was you had prince garin who was the person who was the the main leader of the Roinar at the time. He was left chained up in this cage in um, uh, Tr Troyrain, which was this city which became the Sorrows. And there he called upon the gods of the Roin to rise up and gain vengeance for him and what happened was that yes the seas the, the, the mighty river and this is a huge river incidentally we think if you think about the the river Roin, there there's at one point where Tyrion is on a boat and he looks one way and he looks the other way he cannot see the shores this is a huge river um and that rose up washed away the enemies of the the Roin. obviously this wasn't a long-term victory they had to escape over and ended up over in dawn but uh, what was left at the city was the, the the sorrows this place which was shrouded in mist and this is where the stone men are and the leader of the stone men is is this shrouded lord could it be Garion lannister who went missing it could. My personal take is it's much more likely to be Prince Garin himself. Now, the intriguing thing here is that you say he hesitated before uh, to sort of kill Tyrion. You could read that in a couple of different ways, but the interesting thing here is George R. R. Martin wrote an extra chapter. He wrote a chapter of Tyrion almost certainly meeting the Shrouded Lord and then decided not to go that way. The chapter is hidden away somewhere. He's talked about this, George R. Martin. He said, yeah, maybe when I'm dead, someone will dig it out and publish it. But I, it took Tyrion off in a direction that I decided I didn't want to take him down. And almost certainly that is towards a slightly more magical route because Tyrion has throughout this remained a non-magical character who can he can start to recognize magic in the world but he himself is not a magical character so that that almost certainly was the route at which he was going down so we will never know i suspect who the shrouded lord is certainly with before george r martin uh well releases that or dies and someone else releases it um do I think that Euron met him? I suspect not. We don't actually hear about Euron going into Essos. He tends to stay, from what we've seen, he stays around the the edges and he raided, like the Ironborn do, he raided the, the towns and cities uh, on the shorelines of Essos. So I don't think he did personally uh, meet the Shrouded Lord. Um, question from uh, Vividist Pink. Thank you so much. Saying good morning from Melbourne, Australia. I'm so happy to catch you live. Thanks for all you do. Well, thank you very much and welcome. Uh, uh, it's great if this is your first time watching live. It is a different experience watching live. I hope you get involved in the chat as well uh, as we go on. Um, question from... The uh, Mega Sandra, um, can you share your thoughts on the origins and significance of the sea stone chair? The oily black stone is fascinating. Why the Iron Islands? So I think 
Um, I've, I, I think I've got another question on this one. Actually, I might try and answer the two um, at the same time if I can find it. If not, um, no, I can't find it. Okay, so the um, the sea stone chair. I've I've started answering this, but this is. I think this is George R. R. Martin just doing a nod to H.P. Lovecraft in this. I don't think it has a particular significance, and I know this is the kind of thing people love everything to tie together, but I think this is just one of those things that is a bit of cool background to, that does not have to have a big explanation. Yes, it's this oily black substance, that, that the stone that uh, we find in various other places over in Essos in particular. Um, but I think this is just trying to show us that humanity was not the first here on this world that we've got. It's not trying to show us that there's a specific, I don't think there's a magic attached to the chair. I think it is just this ancient substance. And all through the, the, the purposes, I think, of the black stones, and there are various types of black stone, but the purpose across the piece is to show us that what we have got, this civilization we've got, is actually not the height of whatever civilization have been around on Planetos. That, for various reasons, has been held back. And so when you look at what are the mightiest and greatest structures, not just in Westeros, also in Essos, but if you look in Westeros, the greatest and mightiest structures, the wall, the high tower, um, uh, the um, uh, Storm's End, places like that, they are ancient. They're thousands of years old. Society, and still they are like wonders of the world. Society has not moved on. And that, I think, is the point that George R. R. Martin is trying to show us, is not only has society not moved on, but also there were better things greater things way back in the past and i think that is the that is the point of things like the sea stone chair so i don't think the sea stone, stone chair in and of itself is the important point i think it's what it is telling us about the world that is the important point uh brendan thank you so much for the super chat saying no question at this point i start late tomorrow in norway love your content uh if you're in norway then yes you're a little bit uh later than me as well so um yeah it's getting late for you love your content keep it up thank you so much i really do appreciate that um question from um nicola Trickler, hi there, saying, uh, hello, Robert, hope you and Dan the Doggo are well. Yes, he's gone to bed, as he usually does. What do you reckon is the reason why Euron is so messed up? Is he a failed dreamer, which caused him to go straight chaotic evil, or did he really visit old Valyria and saw something that changed him? Both is the short answer. I th So I think, to start with, he just... He, he, he is a bit like that, and there are always I mean, there are characters in the world, in our world, who are just a little bit um, charismatic evil. What did you say? Chaotic evil. So I think that there's there was that to start with. I do believe that yes, Blood Raven did try and contact him in his youth and did try and um, see whether he could fly. Um, which was what happened with Bran, this the crow visiting him and seeing whether he could fly. And Bran obviously could, but with Euron, the the language he uses, the fact that he has you know, the symbolism of him having this one eye, uh, the fact that he calls himself the crow's eye, all of this does seem to tie in with Blood Raven. So that does seem to be a thing which happened there. Him going to, if he did go to Old Valyria, definitely that will have messed with his mind but also and being a member of the ironborn aristocracy will have built into him this as i talked about the ironborn exceptionalism before it you see it with euron i mean and i think um um that it, they showed it quite well on the show um when you get um theon who goes there and he suddenly feels this goes back to pike having been with the starks for so long and then he suddenly has this feeling to prove himself to show that he is 
he is an ironborn, he is different, he is like them. And that's because of this culture of exceptionalism. He has to prove himself to be not just um, his father's son, but this great warrior who can do all of these wonderful things. That kind of, I mean, we might call it toxic mas masculinity today, but that is definitely there, this kind of exceptionalist idea. Um, so that was in, in built in him, but also more recently, when he's got this barrel of the shade of the evening uh, tree juice, which is what Danny uh, had a little taste of to give her the visions that she had. He seems to have been drinking gallons of the stuff and it's turned his lips blue and that clearly will have warped his mind as well. So there are lots of different things going on with Euron that made him what he is. So I don't think we can just point at one thing and say, ah, that was that was the moment that's uh, there are some things that he was born with. There are some things that people messed with his mind, like Blood Raven. There are some places he went which were messed with his mind. And I think drinking the shade of the evening tree will also have messed with his mind. Um, Dominican Stud 101 saying the Ironborn are seen as raiders by many fans, but we should remember that they're usually not like that, that sometimes the old way is brought back yeah it's it's true so uh, the they don't they haven't always raided but in terms of their culture and uh, who they are we I mean, we do not sow the house words of house Greyjoy is it you know when you first think about it, it doesn't seem uh, it's not all that impressive house words what that means is that they don't farm they don't it's not for them they don't they don't settle down and make their own food they take what they want from other people so this is inbuilt within them this is something that is is there and is passed down from generation to generation and although yes they don't all raid all the time you, if you go back through history you see again and again and again they may sometimes constrain themselves, but during the Dance of the Dragons, they raided the West Coast. Um, uh, Balon Greyjoy had to be called back because they were uh, had the Greyjoy Rebellion. They were raiding again at that point. The, this Every few years, it does come back to this raiding because that is what they consider to their culture to be. And it's also part of where they are that we do not so partly comes from the fact that they live on some very rocky islands that are not uh, predisposed to farming um so if they do wish to get the food then they either scratch out a, a, their meager food provisions that they can get or <coughs> pardon me or they um trade or they raid. Those are the options that are there for them. So uh, more often than not, their instinct has been to do the raiding because that is seen as part of the old way. Uh, so yeah, they don't always, and not all of them always do, uh, but it's um, it's definitely a part of their culture. Um, Eric Fogg, is Asha pregnant from her time with Carl in Deepwood Mott? She fails to use Moon Tea before Stannis attacks. If Carl dies, will Triss be the stepfather? Um, yeah, so I, I touched on this a bit earlier. I think she probably is pregnant. I think the hints are there. We've not had full proof, but I think the hints are there. The question is, what does she do? Now, if when she realizes she's pregnant if she decides to keep it then probably she will want to go back to the iron islands and then she will have to work out who is it that she wants to marry and the logical uh, if she does want to marry um i mean she could decide that she just wants to have the child without um uh, having a, a father there but Yes, the logical place to bolster her claim, and I think she clearly still has 
uh, hopes to rule the Iron Islands, that logical place is back with House Harlor, who are the biggest and strongest house in um, the Iron Islands outside of the Greyjoys. So I think that is the logical place for her to go. And it makes sense for her because obviously uh, Ten Towers, that's um, that's where her mother is as well. So yes, she it, it makes sense. You know, there's a reason for her to go there. And so then she could also be building alliances while she is there. So that's my personal take. I, whether she actively names someone as the father, whether she actively takes someone on as being the father, I think is a completely different matter. But she will be very cognizant of the fact that she has to have a political alliance across the Iron Islands uh, if she wishes to then take rulership of it at some point. Um, another question from Eric Ferg. Um, saying, uh, what's your best guess as to the circumstances behind Asher losing her tongue to Euron and Theon becoming her voice? Now, this is something that I've um, I've speculated on, not, not for a little while, I don't think, but I th it's, it's definitely something I think um, that uh, is possible. I thought it was very possible in the show, and I think this was when I talked about it the most, was that the fact that Euron uh, cuts the tongues out of people, it's not very nice, but it gets mentioned so many times, it does seem to be hinting that it's going to happen at some point. Euron is going to do this at some point. On the show, the fact that he had captured her and then for a couple of episodes that when we saw her, she didn't say anything, did seem to hint to me that perhaps that was what would happen. And I did like, again, on the show, this idea that the, the end of Theon's story could be with him ruling with her and him being the, the voice and her being the person actually in charge. And that worked quite well, I thought, uh, to sort of balance their two strengths. I don't think that that's necessarily going to happen in the books. I, as I say, I think that Theon's end is much more likely to be dying uh, for House Stark. So the question remains, will she lose her tongue? And much as it pains me, the hints are not that it's her who's going to lose her tongue, but it's Theon. The amount of times we have, you know, four or five times that he, either he thinks it or someone threatens that he should lose his tongue because that is his, um, uh, that's his way out of things. He talks his way out of stuff and it's, it's where he gets a lot of his self-worth from. And this is very much a House Lannister thing, this feeling that the Lannisters, uh, through this story, they lose the thing that gives them their self-identity. Jaime loses his sword hand, so suddenly he thought he was this great fighter. Suddenly he is no longer a great fighter. He has to reinvent himself. You get... Um, uh, pardon me, we, we get Cersei, who is slowly, she thinks, losing her beauty. And her, so her great concern is that a younger, more beautiful person is going to come along. Um, whereas she used to be the most beautiful woman in the Seven Kingdoms and all the rest of it. So that's what's playing on her mind, is losing her beauty. Tyrion, the thing which he could lose, which is about his own self-identity, is his tongue. So that's where that idea came from. Um, I, my guess, I, I don't like it because I like the character of Tyrion. He's not always a good character, but he's the character that whose chapters I enjoy reading the most. Um, I, I think that is the most likely answer that he will be the one losing um, his uh, uh, his tongue. Um, the late. Escapist, thank you so much, saying Euron wargs people. People. The key to warging humans is breaking their minds. Bran did break Hodor's mind via temporal uh, the temporal paradox. Euron does this via torture. That's why he cruises his ship with people he's maimed. Um, okay, this is uh, this is fascinating. Uh, fascinating because they 
you have to, you don't have to, but I think that you should view Euron's magical powers, and he does have magical powers, as coming from the Shade of the Evening Tree paste, which is a sort of an inversion of the Weirwood Tree paste, and so his powers are sort of like a corrupted version of that. Bran has this um, has the abilities to see the future and have visions and all the rest of it. He also obviously has the abilities, which he had before he had the Weirwood paste, it has to be said, but these green seer abilities to warg into animals and also humans. I think that you are very right. He can indeed skin change warg into humans. Now, the key bit of this, I think, is the dusky woman. Now, this is a, not a character on the show, so if you've not read the books, you won't know who this is. But Victarion gets sent off by Euron all the way over to uh, to get to Marine to get Daenerys and the dragons and all the rest of it. And George R. R. Martin is, I mean, he's asked about Victarion. He says he's he's as thick as a stump. Um, he doesn't know what's going on. He he thinks that Euron doesn't know what's happening with him. He he thinks that he can get away with um, stealing Daenerys and the dragons for himself. And all the hints are that basically he completely underestimates Euron, and Euron is completely playing him. And we're only gonna we're only gonna see this play out over time. And one thing that is it's never the tension's rarely drawn to it but you get the dusky woman who is this woman that um you're on he gifts he gifts to victorian he says look here's here's a woman for you um you can take her with you you can sleep with her whatever she's had her tongue whipped out of course that's what Euron does um and of course victorian takes her doesn't think about it at all but the hints are that Euron is, uh, he can see through her eyes. He knows what's going on through her in some way. Maybe this is classic skin changing. We don't know. Maybe it's something else going on. We don't know. But clearly, in my mind at least, this is how Euron is keeping tabs on what Victarion is up to. Because he is keeping tabs on what Victarion is up to. He is holding off on the battle that he's got until the moment that Victarion also has his battle, uh, so that there can be two huge battles happening at the same time, so that when all of the magical stuff's going on, the dragon horn is, uh, the hell horn is blown, and, and the uh, all of the wizards and the magic users and the priests are casting whatever spells they are because they've been strapped to the prows of all the boats of Euron's ship. When all of this is going on, uh, Euron is just trying to create this cacophony of magic, this maelstrom uh, of stuff going on because he and, and he just wants to create chaos. So that is what he's up to. But the way that he is keeping tabs on Victarion is through the Dusky Woman. And so, yes, I agree with you uh, that he does and can skin change into humans. Brendan saying Dawn is Lightbringer. Yes, I agree. Uh, I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier uh, when we were talking about something else, but the Sword of Dawn, I, I personally believe it's the only sword which was definitely around during the first long night and um it makes sense the long night was ended by dawn uh, so yes that absolutely makes a sense to me uh eric folk saying how many ironborn survived the battle of blood with euron this is the big battle that euron is uh, setting up um off the south coast of westeros i keep thinking the last thing aaron sees before dying is euron in full valyrian armor flying off on Viserion as the lone survivor, who would then shift to Sam's POV as Euron bathes Old Town in Dragonfire. Uh, points of view are really interesting here. George R. Martin is very aware that 
he he created the style of telling the story which is through different people's perspectives which means that uh, if he wants to show us something happening in a place we have to have a pov character there and he introduces characters as pov characters to allow us to see things if the main character is not there for whatever reason he then adds in a pov character for example so barristan was added in as a pov character because george R. martin knew that daenerys was going to fly off and he, he wanted to show us what was happening in marine while she was gone Melis uh, melisandre was introduced as a pov character in the last book because uh, sam was heading down south and um because John was going to die and he wants us to be able to see what happens at the wall when John is dead. Similarly, we get Aaron Damphair being introduced because he wants us to see what is happening with Euron. He doesn't want us to see from Euron's perspective. That would just be too crazy, I suspect. But he wants us to be able to see it. The only other character, as you point out, who is around that part of the world at the moment, who is a POV character, is Sam, who is in Old Town. So we are going to see the battle from the perspective, <coughs> pardon me, of Aaron Dampere. And he has been strapped aboard uh, on the front of Euron's boat. Will he die then? It's possible, but we have to try and work out where are we going to see Euron's actions from we'll see it from his side until as you say when euron does attack old town which i think he will then i think you're right we will see that from sam's perspective uh, after that i think we'll start seeing things from cersei's perspective when he works his way up and joins forces with her will aaron die in this battle i I'm actually inclined to say probably not in this battle, but um, I think that he won't survive for very long. My instinct is that he, Euron, yes, he's going to get the dragon, but if he gets a dragon, it's because someone blows the hell horn, it is bonded to him and it flies from from slavers bay over to him and that with the best will in the world will still take a long time dragons it's 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 not going to be instantaneous it's not going to happen during this battle it will happen a bit after the battle how this in my mind's eye and we know that something probably will happen which is the old town the library will be burned people say well you know this is because this is like the library of alexander and all the rest of it what is a fantasy way of burning a library particularly one that apparently has got a book in it called the death of dragons dragon fire euron swooping over old town with a dragon for me that is the um it's a horrific thought but i think that that is how old town is going to get blasted is euron's going to attack it with a dragon and that is going to be the thing which is going to attract him to or get cersei and him uh, joined together because she will see that he's actually bringing something the table he has got a dragon so that is um where i see that i don't think that he's going to exit this the first battle on a back of a dragon but i think that he will get a dragon and then at some point after that because we we need sam to have some time to be in old town that's not going to happen straight away um he does have to be able to get in there he's literally only just arrived and he does have to have some time to get in there and learn a few things um, okay, so um, uh, Lee Roberts saying, Hi, Robert, hope you're doing well. Thank you. Can you talk a little about the Red Kraken, Dalton Greyjoy, please? Um, yeah, I'm very happy to. Uh, so he was the, uh, the head of the Ironborn during the Dance of the Dragons. Now, he was... Um, great charismatic figure so he's if you imagine what like a, a 
an ironborn leader should be like that's what he was like so he was the son of the previous lord uh, he heads off um with i think with his uncle um and they go off reaving around the raiding and reaving their way around the world over they go to essos um he gets called the red kraken because um I th his uncle gets killed in one of these raids and he gets revenge he just wades into the battle and he emerges covered in blood and so that's where he gets starts getting called uh, the red kraken um anyway he ends up going back claiming the um the, the throne the sea stone chair for himself in the dance of the dragons what you had at the beginning was both sides the greens and the blacks they basically they were trying to get people onto their side um sending them letters just saying oh you can be this we'll give you that come and help us out and all the rest of it so they both sent letters to uh the red kraken um the greens said well you could be master of ships uh if you want to you can join the small council um and red kraken yeah i'm not really that interested in that uh but then uh rainera Targaryen for the Blacks basically said, I don't, I'm not really offering you anything, but if you want to go raiding the West Coast, <laughs> raiding the Lannisters, go ahead and do it. Um, and so he did. He, the, the Lannisters were joining in with the Greens at the time. So a lot of their forces were off in battle and the House Greyjoy just did what House Greyjoy does. Um, they, they didn't really, it has to be said, they didn't play a huge part in the Dance of the Dragons, but they used it as a way to, and the Red Kraken used it as a way to um, further their own ends. And at the end of it, they had claimed a lot of the other islands around there, um, as well as capturing lots of uh, Lannister children and all the rest of it. And after the war, they just didn't give them back the house targaryen was so weakened after the end of the dance of the dragons that they just they didn't have the ability to do that um so uh, that situation carried on for a little while the lannisters tried to sort of claim some back but they, eventually it was one of his salt wives he had many salt wives uh who just killed him in his sleep <laughs> and i i think she was called tess and um, obviously after that, then there was this succession crisis with uh, the Ironborn and the Lannisters could reclaim what was theirs and everything basically went back to where it was. So he was this charismatic figure. He was very much part of the Ironborn, uh, but ultimately um, he lived by the sword, he died by the sword. And so that's, he didn't gain anything in the long term uh, for uh, the Ironborn. Um, Christian from uh, Sydney, no, was it? Well, yeah, Sydney Rose. Digging a little into the lore of the Iron Islands, the sea stone chair is said to have been created by the Deep Ones. Ah, this was the question I was trying to find earlier. Created the fortress that predates Old Town. I know we're never going to see these ancient mystical creatures, but the fact that the sea stone chair exists and the Iron Islanders have not been able to replicate the substance used to create it seems to prove that ancient races, white walkers, maze makers, deep ones, etc., had very sophisticated technologies or magic. Um, also, have any Iron Islanders ever seen a Kraken, or is that another creature lost to history? Well, I think I've answered the first bit of that uh, already. Yes, there is... Um, ancient technologies and magic were far in advance of what um, there are uh, now. In terms of the second uh, Krakens, they are what I would call semi-mythical creatures in that there aren't many people who have actually seen them, but I don't think anyone denies that they exist. They are out there, it's just that they're not very common. There are, interestingly, a few mentions of them in Fire and Blood, which, again, I think that when 
when we read the Winds of Winter, we'll be able to look back at Fire and Blood and go, ah, so George R. R. Martin was just trying to warm us up to a few ideas here and here and here. I think he was doing an awful lot of that. And I think Kraken's one of the things that he was warming us up to the idea of was the fact that they are attracted by blood in the water said a couple of times there and i think that that is why we're going to see them with this battle of blood with euron's uh, fight against the uh, battle against the red wine uh, fleet um uh, i think that that is going to be um uh, and the royal fleet this is a massive battle it's going to be uh, that is where the um, the krakens are going to come from so they're going to be summoned and they're going to be attracted by blood in the water. Have any Ironborn seen them? Lots of them claim to have. The, the fact is that you don't tend to survive a meeting with one of the Krakens. Um, they are huge, they are very deadly, and they are always out in the middle of the sea somewhere. So if they attack, there's, there's not really many places you can go to um, defend yourselves. So uh, yes, people have seen them. They do exist, but they're just rare and not often seen. Um, question from uh, Brendan saying, I'm sorry, but how will Euron get his dragon? And what dragon will he get? Sorry for all the questions. You do not have to apologize uh, for asking questions. So you're, this is this is very much book stuff. So um, just going from the show, it, we have had confirmation that if we needed it, that the idea that the others, the Night King getting a dragon, that's a show only thing. They, 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 ha they admitted that they had to come up with some way for them, the, the, the White Walkers, to break through the... Um, the wall and then they thought oh well we'll get them to have a dragon so that is an entirely show only thing so the question is what is going to happen with the dragons in the books now we've got the hell horn this um dragon binder this horn which allegedly can control a dragon uh, that Euron has got, that he surely has bound to himself in some way and is surely going to be blown because you do not introduce a massive magical horn, um, make it the centre of this huge plot line, and then for it not to be used. So it will be used, and I suspect that people will... There will be lots of people thinking they know what's going to happen, but I suspect that Euron will be the one who benefits from this. One of the dragons will go to him. Uh, Daenerys won't be there at the time. Which one is it? Well, it's not going to be Drogon, because Drogon is off with Danny. Um, Rhaegal, I think, probably... I'm expecting John to ride. I think this is going to be one of the evidences of his heritage and also it being named after Rhaegar. Then that um, kind of makes sense for it to be John who rides them. A Viserion named after Viserys. Viserys, of course, um, was uh, not the most hinged of characters and it kind of works that it goes to Euron, who is also not the most hinged of characters. So that's the dragon I think he's going to get. I think that it's he's going to get it at some point in the Winds of Winter. We book Euron, his story is going to be so much bigger than on the show. It's going to be absolutely massive, and it's he is going to feel like, for, for a while, like he is being the big baddie, uh, because he has got these ideas which are so massive uh, and so you're actually you're going to end up with the others as a threat from the north with the dragons being a threat from the east and with euron from the west that is where the the, the threats are all going to be coming from um uh, jibber doll thank you so much saying hi robert just got back from the hub glad you're still streaming i was wondering where euron got the dragon horn from greetings from the netherlands well, um, greetings back to the Netherlands. Uh, he got it. It's not, as with all of these things, it's not ever made 100% clear. But from a semi-canon source, he got it from the warlocks from Karth. Um, now, 
the backstory there is that Danny goes to the House of the Undying. She has her visions. They try and capture her dragons, um, or Drogon at least, and uh, Drogon burns them down. She escapes, goes away, um, and they now have a grudge against her for obvious reasons. Uh, they then set off. Piat Pri sets off with three other warlocks uh, with a huge barrel of their magic potion from the shade of the evening trees and apparently also this dragon horn basically trying to hunt her down. But Euron, who at this time is sailing around Essos, he captures them, gets the barrel, gets the dragon horn. That is where that seems to come from. And they make an appearance, Piat Pri and the other warlocks make an appearance in the pre-release chapter from the Winds of Winter, where we see them there um, sort of in the background. It's, this is from Aaron Dampere's perspective, but we kind of see them in the background there. So that's where it is. He kind of claims it comes from Old Valyria, which is kind of him building up this idea that, that's, that he did go to Old Valyria, but semi-canon sources that it comes from the warlocks. Um, I think that's me caught up on the chat. Question from Catherine Furseth saying, thanks for the joy your videos bring while we fight corona depression. Well, I'm really glad that my videos bring joy. That's one of my aims here, it has to be said. The phrase fire and blood is usually connected to the Targaryens. However, I seem to remember that it's also used in connection to the Ironborn by Theon at least once. It's a phrase that carries with it images of war, strength, ruthlessness, a strong will, etc. I think it's fitting in describing the wildness and savage nature of the Ironborn. What do you think this phrase tells us about the Ironborn, and does the use of it in some way suggest that they are somehow similar to the Targaryens? This is... Um, it is really interesting. It led me to do a little search for the phrase fire and blood in A Song of Ice and Fire. And it appears a lot less than you might think, only eight or nine times. And Danny uses it a lot less than you might think. Quentin Martell uses it uh, most, I mean, three or four times, when almost as he's trying to convince himself that he has got some Targaryen heritage. And Theon does indeed uh, use it when he's on his way to uh, the Iron Islands and he's trying to big himself up as being a member of House Greyjoy and as he sees it, the heir to the Iron Islands, uh, trying to big himself up to the captain's daughter. And uh, I think what this shows is it's not a, it's not a Greyjoy thing or an Iron Islander thing. I think this is... Uh, almost Theon showing that Theon has got this mainland perspective as he's going out to the Iron Islands because he's using mainlander language. Uh, but it's also trying to show that this is indeed, as you say, it's a symbol of strength or a phrase of strength, and but it's not the right one. It's showing us that Theon did not understand the Ironborn. That wasn't that's not who they are. So it's almost the opposite, I think, of this idea that this is uh, about the Iron Islanders. I think that's how he perceived them, but he had been brought up not as an island, Iron Islander. He'd been brought up in Winterfell, and so at looking back, that is how he was thinking, but he is wrong. And we see over the few chapters that follow that how his incorrect perceptions of what being an island islander actually means is his undoing and then leads to him trying to overcompensate uh, lady pushkins hi robert um do you think euron's hi do you think euron is the epitome of what is dead may never die as in being reborn somehow i think of reborn or resurrection as something sometimes going well or very wrong what do you think do you think it depends on the underlying personality of the individual um i think 
he Euron has a lot of this symbolism of what is dead uh, may never die without himself embodying it what i mean by that is so he if we are right that he was indeed um, uh, visited by blood raven in his dreams and the implication is that he must have failed that he is one of the people who in bran when bran has his dream then he he's told you know fly or die and he looks down and there are lots of people who couldn't fly and so they just died um and euron presumably was one of the ones who died at least he doesn't seem to have been picked up by blood raven afterwards in the way that bran was so there's that kind of dying but still being alive symbolism he's also got the shade of the evening tree um that he's been using that and that is the house of comes from the house of the undying again this kind of like what is dead may never die kind of feel to him and added to which i think that we're gonna we see cersei and euron meeting up i think cersei is going to get um this kind of undead feel to her we've already had it in vision form the, the idea that you're going to get this uh sort of almost undead female figure with euron which i think is going to be cersei that is probably going to come from um Kyburn, who we know plays around with uh bringing people back from the dead so euron in and of himself what is dead may never die he himself may not personally embody it, but almost kind of surrounding him are all of these different uh, bits of symbolism that add up to this feeling. And that is who he is. He is uh, symbolizing this kind of undeadness. And he is, and there are people who uh, dig into the symbolism a lot more than me, but he is symbolically like the others. He is symbolically like the undead that is the feel that you're you're getting from him so yes whereas he perhaps personally may not be ironborn in any great sense of being religiously ironborn he embodies it in and and what is kind of circling him embodies it in a way that really no one else uh has Diego Godoy saying hello uh, hola Robert hola uh, why did Euron use a faceless man to kill Balon to me it seems a bit too sophisticated a plan given what we know about Euron um, yeah but I think I mean I understand it so Euron did seem to uh, Balon died and uh, then Euron arrives just afterwards and the ghost of high heart basically seem, seems to say that he was Balon Greyjoy was killed by a faceless man and uh, you're on the if you join the dots together you're on perhaps had something like a dragon egg he seems to claim that he had a dragon egg and threw it away and lots of people suggest that perhaps he gave this dragon egg to the faceless men um in payment for killing uh, Balon why didn't he do it himself well I think the politics of this were that Balon died and then there ha then there was a king's mood and if um Euron had come back and it had been very obvious that he had been the person who killed Balon he may well not have had all the support he he had if people suspected that he might have been involved but didn't know for sure then that was a very different thing so i think this is purely about um the practicalities of the politics of how to make himself be the best candidate in the king's mood uh dominic vaughan saying hi robert more of a fun speculative aside here any thoughts on uh, the lonely light or house farwind also there is a uh, house stone tree on Harlow. I assume this eponymous tree is a fossilized weirwood. Yeah, so um, in terms of um, house Farwind, the lonely light, uh, I talked about there being uh, uh, an archipelago 
Iron Islands. But if you head off westwards from there, then after, and I can't remember how far it is, like, I think it's two weeks travel or something, then you get another small group of islands that are even more rocky and even more out of the way. And there's a lighthouse. They built a lighthouse on there. This is the Lonely Light. This is about as far west as humanity has ever really got. Um, and their house, Farwind, is the name that's there. Now, I, any theories about them? There's there's lots of possibilities that they may have some kind of warging abilities. Um, I don't think that this is going to play a huge part of the plot, to be honest. I think that it is just a, an extra reminder that, yes, people do sometimes try and head west, uh, and that's about as far as they've ever got. So I think that's what that is. In terms of Stone Tree, we don't um, we don't know much about them. So this is on Harlow Island. Pardon me, Harlow Island. There is a house. House High Harlow is the biggest house, obviously, on the island. But there are a number of um, smaller houses there. One of which is House Stone Tree. We just get a passing reference to it. Asher sees. Uh, their standard, uh, which is a grey tree um, uh, on a black background, I think it is. Now, what does this suggest? I think this is just an extra hint that, yes, we know that weirwood trees are, when they die, they become ossified, they become stone. And this, I think, just adds to the working theory that we have that perhaps the weirwood network did once extend across to the iron islands perhaps the iron islands were closer at some point perhaps even when the uh, the hammer of the waters happened and you get the neck uh, being sort of half submerged underwater perhaps that also in the same way that the first hammer of the waters apparently uh, destroyed the land bridge leading to an archipelago uh, between westeros and uh, between dawn and essos leading leaving archipelago of stepstones maybe this second hammer of the waters also created the archipelago uh, of the iron islands it's a theory, and perhaps that cut off the Iron Islands from the mainland, which uh, cut off the route uh, that the weirwood trees had there for any weirwood trees that there were there just became stone. Hence, you get house stone tree. It's it's a theory. We don't have any more information than um, about house stone tree other than the fact that they have a stone tree, and this is on their uh, banner. Um, Vera Glauben saying, Hi Robert, we know from Asher that hers and Theon's mother is longing to see Theon again after all these years. Do you think they will meet? Can it be part of Theon's arc? Um, P.S. A gentle reminder to bring your merch into frame. I've remembered, guys. Look. Uh, that's a Crock and Tacos mug uh, available down there somewhere if you want to click the link. Um, thank you for the reminder. Um, the uh, Theon's mother, Theon and Asher's mother, is at um, House Harlow at the moment. She is in the Ten Towers, which is their castle uh, called the Ten Towers. They have ten towers, and they're all different architectural styles. It's it's quite a crazy place. Um, and she seems it's quite sad when we actually uh, meet her because she's. Uh, she seems to be suffering from dementia or something along those lines. Uh, it's never really um, described in great detail. Uh, she spends a long time wandering the corridors, looking for her lost sons and, and things like that. Um, is it part of Theon's arc to go back to her? I don't think think so as i say i think his arc is a lot more concentrated up in the north and with the starks i think it is ashes i think that that she will head back there and i think that we're going to hear a lot more about house harlow in uh the winds of winter or the latter part of the winds of winter with asher so i think that is where that is heading uh and i think that we will see a little bit more there and i think if she if 
Asha does have a child, then that will play in well with the mother who feels that she has lost her children in some way. Um, just while I have a quick moment, if you, uh, I did mention my patrons before I try to do it every single time. Uh, if you do want to support this channel, if you, um, enjoy what I do want to support if you want to get access to some patron only benefits there is a link first of all thank you patrons and then there's a link down in the description to that if you're a ten dollar plus patron then one of your perks is a chance to um, influence what what I produce um, what content I produce and there's actually uh, you've got I think about three more days left I've put up a uh, a poll for $10 plus patrons about what I should be covering on these live streams once I've finished this series that I'm doing at the moment, looking at the areas, the regions of Westeros. So if you are a $10 patron, uh, do check that out and do uh, let me know over there what you would like me to cover. If you'd like to become a $10 patron, then the link is down there. Um, questions from my patrons, all patrons get a chance to uh, ask questions saying uh, lawn doc 20 saying hi robert we have to see the upcoming battle of winterfell through someone's eyes so who do you think it will be asher theon both and what will asher and the rest of her men do when the battle starts fight flee attempt to save theon and the chaos to come what do you think um and since we're talking about pirates a special shout out to my tampa bay buccaneers for winning the super bowl uh, well done the tampa bay buccaneers American football is not my sport, uh, but uh, well done them. Um, what about the Battle of Winterfell and the POV? So I, I touched on this a little bit earlier. George R. Martin is very aware of the need. He tells his story through POV characters. And so he makes sure that we have POV characters if we are going to see some action. So the only two people who's, who are POV characters who are currently near there are Asher and Theon. Now, when we're talking about the Battle of Winterfell, I think we need to be quite clear that there's going to be at least two battles coming up. The first is a confrontation which will happen when the Freys and the Mandalees come to take on Stannis's forces. Now, that one, I suspect we will probably see um from theon's perspective maybe also ashes now theon is going to be taken to a weirwood tree um to receive his fate from stannis stannis is under the impression that theon killed bran and rickon and he's also under the impression that um if he kills Theon because of this, this will help him dear him to the Northern Lords. All very logical if you get into Stannis's mind. So Asher has or has been trying to persuade Stannis that, and this is in the pre-release chapter, the Theon pre-release chapter from the Winds of Winter, that this should happen not just a random execution, but on near at a, a weirwood tree which is on an island in the middle of a frozen lake nearby. Now, this opens up huge amounts of possibilities, because, and I suspect that a lot of things are going to happen at the same time. Uh, Asher, I probably will try and save Theon. That's probably why she want, wants this to happen, because she sees this is the only way that she's going to get Theon out of this, is if we get him out and away from the main bit of the army, then she can try to do some rescue mission. She likes doing these kind of rescue missions. But also, um, the um, uh, the fact that it's a weirwood tree, and we've now got Bran working through the weirwood trees, opens up the possibility that it's Bran slash Bloodraven through the weirwood tree, that he's going to be saved somehow but also house mandalay who are coming in are under the they they know that rickon is alive and if they know that rickon is alive then the idea that theon killed rickon is suddenly undercut completely so there are lots of different ways how theon could survive this which means that he almost 
certainly will survive this. So anyway, that's the first thing. And I think lots of things are going to happen in and around that. The second thing is how does how does Stannis take Winterfell? That one, I think, uh, probably is going to are Again, it'll be some combination of Asher and Theon. Um, it, Theon knows how to get into Winterfell, so he will almost certainly be um, involved in this. And so we we're almost certainly going to see it from his perspective. So it's more likely from him than from Asher. As I say, I think Asher will probably be making an exit at some point reasonably soon. Um, Joseph uh, Dowie, uh, thank you very much, saying, hello, love your content, thank you. What's your favourite bit of tinfoil that links in with the Iron Islands? Keep it up. I think my favourite bit of tinfoil with the Iron Islands, and I don't know how tinfoil it is, is the thing that I've been talking about with the Naga's ribs, that uh, they are actually, this is actually a long dead weirwood grove, not a sea dragon, but this this is the um, the... Iron Islands used to be attached to the mainland in some way. The hammer of the waters cut them off. All the weirwoods died, and the Ironborn, who were the first men who happened to be on the Iron Islands when that happened, they did not then uh, take up the uh, worship of the old gods, but they developed their own religion. And what we have left of the weirwood trees are not treated with any particular reverence, but they're just there as um, ancient um, things that are there that uh, aren't being viewed as trees, perhaps a lot of them either. So that's my favourite bit of uh, tinfoil. I don't even know if tinfoil is the right word. I think that there's a reasonable amount of evidence for that, um, but it's certainly never spelt out. Uh, question from Lady Dane. I like the moment in the show when Sansa and Theon bonded just before the big battle. I don't think they have to become romantically involved, but I do think Sansa is a good person to provide stark forgiveness to Theon, not just Bran, who is not really Bran anymore. What do you think? I, yes. I mean, I liked that you know, on the show. I thought that worked really well. It worked well, I think, because of the fact that Theon and Sansa had that link through Ramsay. They'd, they'd both been abused by Ramsay, and so they had that link. So I think that allowed that to happen. In terms of him getting forgiveness from House Stark in some way, I agree Bran was probably not the best person to do it. I think he could do it if he, it's useful for the Weirwood Network for um, Theon to have that forgiveness. So, I mean, I don't think that she's got that history, so I don't think in the books, that history with Theon, so I don't think in the books that, that she's necessarily the right person. I don't think Aya is necessarily the right person. Um, so it probably comes down to John, and I think that that is where it his forgiveness will come from. Rickon is probably going to appear for a short period, and maybe he can say, hey, you didn't kill me, so it's okay. But I think that it... it he needs to hear from somebody who has the voice of authority for House Stark, and I think John is probably the the person who will have that. He's going to be the Lord of Winterfell at some point in this story. Um, question from the Greasy Strangler, saying, I hope you're well. Thank you, I am. Can you shout out my friend Justin Petronis? He's a new watcher, and I'm hoping he will join me as a patron one day. Well, hi, Justin. Uh, great to uh, see you. Uh, what sort of things do you think Euron got up to on his travels to Valyria? Is this where he got the Valyrian suit of armor and the dragon egg? Um, and uh, another quick question, if I may. I've always been fascinated by his ship, the Silence. Any interesting things you can tell us about it? Well, I think I've talked a bit about Euron's travels already, uh, but I will happily talk about the Silence because it is an interesting ship. It's um, it's large, 
it is crewed by uh, slaves, but they they have all had their tongues cut out. This is why it's called the Silence, not just because it's sort of large and swift and uh, not a noisy vessel, but also the crew can't talk. So it is a quiet ship. And it's single-masted. It's got black sails. And it also has um, red, painted red, all of the decks. And the reason why the decks are painted red is apparently because there's so much bloodshed there that it just soaks in. Uh, so it is uh, an interesting ship. It is deliberately set apart. People recognize it. The Iron Islanders recognize it specifically as Euron's ship. And um, it's people like Victarion even think of it as, as being not just a that's Euron's ship, but it is a fast ship. Um, so it's for being single masted, which is, is quite interesting. I mean, I'm not really a shipwright, but um, normally with the, the bigger ships like that, you would have, if, if you want something that's fast and is nimble, which is what this appears to be, then you'd expect it to have more than the single mast, more sails uh, to offer greater um speed and an and ability to tack around a lot so there is the hint there and there are more hints if you start digging into it that the ship itself is not necessarily all that's going on there euron perhaps he has some sort of control over the weather the elements in some way there are there are hints that he manages to get places quicker than he should be able to or a navy which is coming towards him seems to slow down mysteriously and no one really knows how or why. So the, the hints are that it's not just the ship itself, it's Euron who perhaps has some uh, powers going on. Um, the late escapist saying, I firmly believe that Euron is a skin changer and will walk a, tr a kraken. After all, what would be the point of establishing that Iron Islanders have her her, uh, have an hostility? Uh, historical tradition of skin changing i.e the far winds of the lonely light without a major character from the iron islands being a skin changer yeah so i agree I, I talked a bit earlier that i think that this is going to come in whether he skin changes a kraken i don't know but i i'm very sure that he in some way skin changes into the dusky woman who um it which is how he can see what victarian is up to uh, which makes him again this kind of mirror for Bran. Um, I've got a couple more questions from my uh, patrons. Um, pardon me. Uh, so uh, now is the time. If you've got any questions in the chat, I will try and pick up as many questions in the chat as I can. Um, but I will just finish off these couple of questions from my patrons. Shah Shah saying, hi, Robert. I believe I vaguely mentioned, uh, vaguely remember that the sea stone chair is actually made of black stone which is really special, but I keep forgetting exactly the significance of the different kinds of black stone. Could you summarize these for me? Yeah, this was the other question that I was looking for. Um, uh, and, and so I've answered some of it um, uh, earlier on, but in terms of the black stone, I did say I'd try and unpack this a little bit more. The black stone you get a few different types of black stone. We, we often talk about it as being all the same and it's not all the same there's this oily black stone which is what the sea stone chair is made of um that seems to be the same substance as what is in a shy the the walls are of the buildings are oily black we're told that drink light um so we, we don't actually go to a shy we just hear about it so we don't know but that it's that's noticeable the, these two things are complete opposite ends of the map as we know it so that's one type that we have we've also got uh, a sort of fused stone which is the high tower and the five forts we're told about there's a few other places the maze makers seem to have used this this is um possibly the same as the oily black stone in that it seems that it can be quite slick, but 
it is definitely of a different kind of proportion. The, the, the five forts are huge and they appear to be all of one stone. The base of the high tower is all is the same. Uh, the, the high tower itself is all stone, uh, normal stone for most of its height, but the base of it is made of this kind of fused black stone. Then the third main kind is um, this, um, what we might call dragon stone. So we, we know about where this comes from. So the Valyrian roads that crisscross Essos, the uh, the black, uh, black walls in Volantis, also dragon stone, they seem to have been made by this kind of uh, black dragon stone, which is so called because it seems to sort of a, a combination of magic and dragon fire can uh, mold this stone into whatever shapes you want. Uh, and the final type that we hear about, which may be the same as ends one or more of the above, is the kind of the basalt black rock that we have at Moat Kaelin. What connects all of these things is that they're old. The the dragonstone fused rock is the most recent coming from the Valyrians, but the other things are very old. Moat Kaelin is a very, very old uh, castle. So um, that's, those are the different types. They do seem to be described slightly differently, but this black stone seems to be a um, a hint that this is ancient, that this is some uh, way of moulding stone magically, perhaps, that has been lost to us over time. Um, reflective rambling. Um, hi there. This is a question from Robinson88. I love it when people do this. You do a lot uh, reflective rambling. And thank you so much for picking up questions from other people in the chat saying, how do you think Kyburn learned about the King's Moot when he reported it very quickly to Cersei? Does he have a source on the Iron Islands, or was it magic? I think he has a source on the Iron Islands. The um, He has been picking up um, spy networks that uh, Varys previously had and others, and he has been using them for the crown. The The crown is aware of what's going on. Um, also, it's um, the Iron Islands aren't, they're not all rabidly followers of the old way. There are some who are loyal to the Seven Kingdoms, and uh, the there are maesters there who will um, happily uh, shoot off uh, messages to the Citadel, uh, and obviously Kyburn still has connections in with the Citadel. So if you are looking for a magic route, then you would say uh, that perhaps someone like Marwyn the Mage could have found out about it, and perhaps he could have passed information on to Kyburn because... Uh, he has some sympathies there, uh, but I think it's much more likely that it's just he has he has allies there. Um, it could be literally anyone uh, that the whole point about the King's Moot is that all of the great and the good, the ship's captains, all gather to decide. And so any one of them could um, tell people what was going on. Uh, it, it was not not top secret is what I'm trying to say. It was all done in public. Um, the uh, Mattia Dominique saying, in Deep Geek, I've always wondered why Sam didn't pass on the west coast of Westeros. Is it the Ironborn, the lack of maps, storms, or something else? To me, Bravos is a huge detour. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I understand that. I think it's his pure geography. Um, yes, I think you're right on all of those things that we get the the Iron Islands and they that will make things hard but uh, the the geography of the wall is that it it goes up to the east coast but on the west it doesn't actually go right up to the coast um it goes there's this gorge that it sort of stops at so there's no easy way to access the sea off to the west 
Um, there's the mountains then pass, uh, carry on down there. So the quickest and easiest way always for the uh, the watch is to go from East Watch, which is where their navy is. They don't have a navy on the West Coast. So um, I think it's purely practicalities that um, do it. And going via Bravos is... Um, Pardon me. It's just simply that's the uh, the the easiest route to get. Bravos is a huge port, and so you can get boats in and out of there quickly, theoretically quickly. Anyway, obviously, uh, Sam had a little bit of a detour while he was there, and a bit of a hold up. Um, question from I think this is the last one from my patron saying Sasuke saying I'm wondering. If you think George will use the story of Torgon the Latecomer for a parallel in Theon's arc, I like the idea. Yet there's so many ways you can go with all of House Greyjoy's members. Um, yeah, so Torgon the Latecomer was this was way back when they had King's Moots before they didn't for a very long time. He he was away, and they didn't tell him that he was the obvious candidate to. Uh, be the next king and he wasn't told and then when he comes back it's like well why didn't you tell me uh, and then he said he declared it illegal because he wasn't there and he should have known about it um, and he reclaimed the uh, or he claimed the uh, sea stone chair basically by force so um is that is George R. R. Martin going to use that for Theon? I don't think so. Theon was there when the the, um, uh, the King's Moot happened, and incidentally, it's for for all of our obvious dislike of Euron, he he was and is the closest thing we have to a legitimately elected ruler in the entirety of the Seven Kingdoms, because um, you get, yes, you have the Night's Watch, you sort of vote on who should be their ruler. But uh, other than that, this is just hereditary monarchies, basically, across the piece, and hereditary lordships. Um, the Iron Islanders with the King's Moot, this was by acclaim of the Iron Islanders. Euron did not come in and steal this by force he went there and persuaded them that he should be the king and they said yes so whereas on the show they tried to play it that you know he shouldn't have been the ruler he he was by that he played by the rules at that point um and that's what he got himself made king and he is now the legitimate king and the closest thing uh, in the in the seven kingdoms to being a democratically elected ruler which is uh, pretty ironic given how he doesn't really care about what other people think but that's the way of it okay let's go to uh, the chat uh, i've got uh, i'll try and pick up a few questions from the chat um uh, Ballroom Blitz saying Euron is like Stannis, but better in every way. I mean, I don't know. It depends what you mean by better. He's certainly um, uh, more charismatic, I think I would say. Um, sounds like saying, I mean, he was legitimately elected in the same way as the president of Turkmenistan was. Um, your, your knowledge of the politics of Turkmenistan probably exceeds mine. Uh, but uh, yes, when I say the closest thing to a democratically elected leader, I do not mean that he was purely democratically elected but he was um uh, it, it's it's not just a matter of him being the next ruler because he happened to be his father's son that kind of thing um questions from there must be a few more questions up here um Nightfall, oh yes, yeah, so Andrew Kay's picking up on the Valyrian Steel Swords. Nightfall and Red Rain uh, seem naturally aimed Valyrian Steel Swords in Ironborn possession, given what Euron is up to. Yes, they both do. There aren't very many Valyrian Steel Swords over in the Iron Islands. We certainly don't hear of a House Greyjoy Valyrian Steel Sword. The only two, Nightfall and Red Rain, are the two that we hear of. Um, um, I mean, Nightfall was once a House Greyjoy one, it would appear, but ended up with House Harlor, I think it's with at the moment. Uh, Red Rain, we talked about actually, I think last time, this 
possibly comes from House Reign, the reigns of Castamir. Um, certainly it seems very suspicious that what appears to be a hedge knight wandering around alone in Westeros had a Valyrian steel sword, which was then taken from him um, and ended up with House Drum, I think it is. Um, uh, okay, so uh, Sasak saying the westernmost castle of the wall is not manned. Uh, well, the second to westernmost is uh, the Shadow Tower, um, but yeah, it doesn't doesn't end go all the way up to the um, uh, the sea, which is the main point. Um, Okay, so I think that's probably uh, Chrissy of Oldstones uh, just saying good night. Uh, great to see you, uh, Chrissy. Thank you so much, and thank you all of my um, uh, moderators. I see Carl Carlsnark, um, uh, Chrissy of Oldstones, Andrew Kay, and I think we had uh, Crack and Tacos is there as well. Uh, thank you all. Excellent job as always. Okay, guys, I think I am going to uh, call that one a day. Now, what we'll do next time is why don't we move around we did the westlands last time why don't we have a look at the reach next time uh which will include places like uh high tower uh the, yeah, house high tower um high garden old town all the areas around that as well okay thank you so much some fantastic questions uh and i will see you again this time next week bye everyone